Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Brand Studio Live, the series that brings together the country's top CXOs to share their insights into the hottest topics in marketing, branding and business. I'm Ramit Arora and as always, we're in the newsroom today with a fresh set of brand masters. Our brand masters are the heroes of this show. They inspire us with their ideas and perspective. They open up new channels of conversation and they give us a lot to learn. Without further delay, let's begin with today's episode. As any marketing leader or business owner would agree, building a strong brand takes effort. It is not a static process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a continuous cycle of learning, unlearning, and having to dig deep. Research group Kantar says that strong brands are built on four key elements. Identifying future growth opportunities, connecting to the culture of consumers, organizing the business for growth, and embracing digital channels. It's also about being able to spell out your core values, being consistent across customer touch points and telling the world about your value proposition and what you bring to the table that nobody else can. How do you remain flexible in dynamic market conditions and conditions like we are in today? More importantly, as a brand, how do you practice long-term thinking instead of focusing on the immediate future? These are just some of the questions that we hope to answer in today's episode with today's brand masters. Our first speaker, our guest today, is Sanjeev Kapoor, Chief Commercial Officer of Vistara. Previously, the Chief Operating Officer of SpiceJet, where he brought about a transformational turnaround. Sanjeev has also worked with airlines in Asia, Europe, and in the US. Welcome to the Brand Studio live show, Sanjeev. Thank you, Ramit. Building brands with experience, because experience is something that has longevity. Experience is something that has multiple touch points. It has emotion. It has... Uh, it has all the makings of something a downturn can't break down. But building brands of experience is also expensive. And it's also the tougher route. Because every time a downturn happens, every time competition makes it tougher for you, experience is the first thing many brands tend to break down. Talk to us a little bit about your journey about building experience brands and building experience brands that don't fall. You know, building experience brands or connecting with customers doesn't have to be expensive. Both when I was involved in a situation where the airline was going through tough times and currently where we are in a very different situation with my current airline. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money to connect, but you have to find some means of emotionally connecting with the customers and making them loyal to you and making them stand by you even during the downtime. I think when a brand has gone, gone through difficult times, and has made mistakes in the past, I think it's uh, the right thing to do is to say, look, we know we messed up. We'll make it up to you. We're sorry. And then you have to deliver. You have to deliver on the promise. You have to deliver on the earnestness. You have to deliver on the commitment that you're going to do better. Um, with uh, Vistara, uh, we are a very well-funded airline. Uh, you know, legendary parents, Tata and Singapore Airlines. The challenge here is that we are small. We've come late. And uh, it's been hard to grow because of infrastructural constraints, slots, etc. We really focus on differentiation. That how do you make people actually look forward to flying and look forward to flying Vistara? How do you make people say that if Vistara's got a flight, we know Vistara doesn't have as many flights as some other airlines. But if Vistara has a flight, book us on Vistara. And we're doing that by trying to make flying something that you can look forward to again, like you used to in the old days. Yeah. People used to dress up to fly. Yes. It was a special occasion. It was something that, you know, uh, you didn't take so much for granted. It, it was magical. And we want to bring back the magic of flying. We want to bring back the glamour of flying, so to speak. If you watch the TV show Friends, the coffee shop is a third place. Yes, yes. Right? Where people can just go and relax and be themselves. Uh, Starbucks has said that they're the third place between office and home. Yeah. We want to make them feel like they've entered a place where they can just be themselves and relax and chill. Uh, the kind of music we play, the music, uh, the boarding and landing music actually gets us a lot of feedback. People can't believe that we're playing soft rock. We're playing jazz and blues. We're playing music that people yes. grew up to. We came up with a concept called the retrojet, 
And we have these special retro flights where we uh, publicize it quite widely. Mm -hmm. And people who fly it, customers actually dress up for these flights. Mm -hmm. And they say it's like nothing else. The whole atmosphere, the whole mood, uh, the whole experience is so different that, uh, you know, the number of articles that have been written about the retro jet, uh, you know, the, the payback on it in terms yeah. of coverage, the brand it's helped us build, uh, just, just the eyeballs it's captured has been tremendous. So for very little investment, find emotional connects, uh, be honest with the customers, make them trust you, make them want to give you, if you're going through trouble times, make them want to give you a second chance. If you're not going through trouble times, but you're a new entity, make them try you. Uh, is it all working? Are there metrics that's showing that, that the differentiation that you've built in right. terms of the flying experience is actually being rewarded by a customer? All I can say is that the metrics that uh, are related to brand building are clearly moving in the positive direction. Uh, what you hear from uh, travel agents and OTAs and, and our customers directly is that they're willing to pay a modest premium uh, to fly Vistara. Uh, I think we're proving that uh, you can still have a premium brand and charge a, a, a reasonable premium and people will pay for it. Wonderful. Yeah. Do we have questions from the group? Um, I'm also a frequent flyer of Vistara, but I've not seen something of those levels basically where uh, tie up with petrol pumps or stuff like that, which is mm. more user friendly and stuff. So do you have a program like that? I know you have a program yeah. similar, but maybe uh, the kind of a user friendly program that uh, JP Miles has, I think mm. I would request if you could elaborate or explain if you have plans. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Uh, we do have a loyalty program called Club Vistara. But you're absolutely right. We don't have the number of partners uh, that a larger program or a more established program uh, would have. It's a function of two things. Number one is uh, until recently, we were quite small. Uh, any such partnership for a loyalty program takes a fair bit of investment in IT on both sides. Secondly, because of the unfortunate uh, exit of one player from the market, a lot of uh, partners uh, or, or entities that were partnered with that player are also now looking at alternatives and they're approaching us. So I think uh, while, uh, while you're right that we've been quite light on partnerships, it's been because of a smaller scale and other options that existed for potential partners. The team is working very hard at it and we've, we are finally getting um, the kind of traction that, uh, that one requires to make it work. So as you grow and scale, uh, what are your thoughts on keeping the operational service experience at par like it is right now? And I think that's another excellent question. There are two principles we use, or two things that we keep training our frontline uh, on. One is that, so we train our staff uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, actively on uh, handling uh, what we call IROPS, irregular operations. That when things go wrong, when flights are delayed, when flights are canceled, how you communicate with the customers, how you handle them, how you provide them alternatives, etc. The second thing that we do, uh, that we really stress upon in our training is the concept of human decency, which is uh, just a simple application of the principle, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, if you were in a similar situation. I think this is a fantastic case study in a brand, for a brand built with a lot of maturity, in tune with the times. Thank you so much. Thank that you, was a great opening session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. I hope I can make it down without trip. I'd now like to introduce my next guest, Apurva Chamaria, Chief Revenue Officer of Raidkin. Prior to Raidkin, Apurva was a Global Head of Corporate Marketing for HCL Technologies. In 2016, he was recognized as the Marketeer of the Year by the World Leadership Forum and the Digital Marketeer of the Year by IAMAI. Quickly, Apurva, the rules of B2B marketing are changing very fast and internet and technology have made sure that they're changing every day. What do the rules look like? What do B2B players do to stay on course? Uh, the small players, the big players, uh, technology, no technology. What's the golden rules? I personally don't look at B2B marketing and B2C differently. Sure. Uh, predominantly, even in B2B, people buy from people. Companies never buy That's from true. companies. Uh, classical rules of marketing still apply. Yeah. And uh, I think marketers have to go back in recessionary times to the core essence of marketing which for me is three things, simplicity, simplify the customer experience, both physical, digital, and service experience. Uh, you can't make it very clever, you can't make it overcomplicated. The second is deep empathy, 
that only comes from really, really well-rooted understanding of customer journeys, understanding customer aspirations, consumer aspirations, uh, their fears, their drivers, their motivations. And third is always be in the business of offering unexpected value. So there is a minimum viable product. Uh, a car is supposed to get you from point A to point B. Uh, a movie theater is supposed to show you the movie. But can you be in the business of offering unexpected value, which actually creates customer delight? So I think if marketers can think of simplicity, empathy and unexpected value, uh, they would really, really do themselves and their brands a great deal of service in these turbulent times. I, I love the fact that 20 episodes down, every single brand studio live episode finally goes down to marketing 101 and to the basics. Uh, but are there any new skills that marketing organizations need? Are there any new, uh, are there any new ways of thinking that weren't needed 10 years ago? Do we need to co-opt a certain kind of people into our teams now? Very, very good question. So I always believe that one of the biggest challenges in marketing and business leadership today is we hire more people like us. So typically marketers would go to the same top business schools, hire more people like them. And you perpetuate a culture of similar thinking. You, you're still not hiring people from liberal arts. You're still not hiring graphic designers. You're still not hiring people from NSD who are trained in storytelling. You're still not hiring data scientists. How can a similar homogeneous team deliver heterogeneous unexpected results? True. So I think uh, we have to be more courageous. We have to practice braver, bolder marketing. And we have to get a cross-disciplinary team. That's, that's the opportunity before us. Clearly what you're saying is fresh ideas is the order of the day and, and you need to co-opt as many ideas as you can from the world into your teams. Yes. But does that also mean that, uh, and I know you've written about this, that leadership thinking needs to be needs to change because you can co-opt people, but finally a lot of the strategic direction is happening at the level of the leader. You're completely right. So my second book, Mastering Growth Hacking, yeah. was about how the top 10 internet companies in India have really, really mastered the art of non-linear growth by doing very, very frugal innovation, uh, cut through marketing. And one of the ways in which leadership has to change is we all have to become servant leaders from being rockstar CEOs, rockstar CMOs who know it all, who have all the answers, who are the loudest voice in a meeting room and occasionally the only voice in the meeting room to actually really, really becoming servant leaders, listening more, uh, co-opting ideas uh, and often the best innovation will come from outside our industry. So what can auto companies learn from media companies? What can media companies learn from mobility companies? What can both learn from the way telecom marketing is being done? So servant leadership becomes very important. Uh, second is authentic leadership. And one of the core parts of building a sustainable brand is when you define your higher purpose thinking, uh, I would only call it true if during downturns, you can stay true to your core. Mm. Or do you give up your purpose as soon as you hit a turbulent patch and you get back to doing whatever is immediate, whatever is profitable. Fantastic messages. Go back to the basics, bring in fresh ideas and the whole concept of a new leadership, which is actually servant leadership. Uh, very, very fresh thoughts. Thank you so much. It was fantastic having you here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome my next guest, Konya Khanna, Head of Marketing, Swarovski India. Konya has worked in the premium luxury goods and lifestyle space with a focus on apparel and jewelry. Her expertise lies in driving business results through brand leadership, positioning, retail leadership, trend analysis, and overall marketing management. My pers the perspective that I have is that product brands that have purpose and have slightly higher order purpose are always the product brands that have longevity, uh, and stamina. Talk to us a little bit about that, both from the lens of Swarovski and the brands that you worked with, and from the fact that you that you actually uh, operate in a premium, almost luxury space. Uh, how important is purpose to a product brand? And I think it's a fantastic question about purpose of brands, uh, because uh, what I've seen and personally I believe that purpose for any brand, uh, whether it's uh, I mean, a product brand, it's a platform brand, it's uh, it's any brand, actually. I think purpose is, is, is key and that's what makes the brand live many, many years. So 
and when we talk about Swarovski also being a product brand, uh, we are now managed by the fifth generation Swarovski family members. It's a family held um, company and um, what's been uh, key is from when the founder started, it's when Daniel Swarovski started Swarovski in 1895. Uh, his vision and his purpose was to make a diamond for every woman. So it was very much about luxury, but it was about inclusive luxury. So we are always working with other industry partners. We are working with trend leaders. We are working with brands. We are working with the leading designers. So we are always working with different people to create products with Swarovski crystal. So I don't know uh, how many people know, but in 1895 when Swarovski as a brand was started, it was always a B2B brand. And the B2C face of Swarovski that you all see now when the first stores were only set up in 1980. So that's relatively recent for a brand that's uh, going to be 125 years next year. I totally agree that uh, you know having a very strong purpose and emotionally connecting with uh, with your uh, with your uh, I would not even say consumer but your family almost of uh, your consumer family is is very very key and I think what's uh, important for most brands that have seen this longevity. Fantastic. I do have another question, but I'm going to ask if yeah, Sudhi. People in India traditional gold investors, be it jewelry or whatever, you know. So what is the change? How did you go about shifting the mindset from, from glitter to light? So, uh, yeah, it's, so it's very interesting. Uh, so 2001, when we came into the country, when Swarovski, uh, you know, came into the country and actually I joined Swarovski at that time as part of the first team. Uh, at that time, gold was almost at like six, seven thousand for 10 grams. And uh, a pair of Swarovski earrings was around three, four thousand, I remember, rupees. So you could definitely get a gold pair of earrings, the same size as a Swarovski pair of earrings. But, you know, at that point, there was an exact comparison. Then, of course, gold prices started rising. So fast forwarding uh, to 2014, we saw through Euro Monitor reports that there was still a wide gap in the market for premium costume jewellery or fashion jewellery. Uh, because uh, the only brand in the country at that time that was providing this was our own brand Swarovski. But today the consumer is changing across age groups and they want to travel. They want to travel with jewellery. They want to, uh, you know, they want to make it easy. Like, you know, just put it in my, uh, you know, in my dresser and, you know, I can just change things around, have four looks a day, carry jewellery in my bag. Young customers, today's customers yeah. uh, versus their parents and their grandparents. Uh, how is the relationship with the brand changed and how has the brand evolved in Correct. its proposition to young people uh, versus you know the, the proposition to to their parents 20 years ago so it's a very interesting uh, question and like you said parents and grandparents so we have uh, people who say that okay my grandmother gave me you know this piece of uh, a figurine and you know it's uh, I need it repaired like this and can you do this for us so we offer that kind of service so what's what's been consistent is that the brand has been loved across generations yeah. what has been loved of the brand has been constantly changing so uh, whilst for the generation you know like our parents generation or the grandparents generation that traveled out of the country went to certain locations got like pieces of figurines back you know, decorated it in their nice showcases and all. Um, you know, that was what Swarovski was, say, in 2001. Um, you know, a, a jewelry brand. Yeah. So, because that's easier. So, the 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 customer loves the product, but now they would like to carry it around. So, the jewelry uh, uh, category is, I mean, of course, the figurines will always be the legacy, but the jewelry category is, you know, so much more easier to, you know, carry carry with you. So, that's changed. Then comes, you know, the next generation who are wearing T-shirts and who want to exp express themselves like that. So, um, I, I don't know if many people know, but a lot of the brands like even Levi's and Gap make T-shirts with Swarovski crystals. So, you know, you have slogans or you have, uh, you know, you can do personalization or you can get a Pashmina shawl and, you know, have your name written on it. So, there's a lot of kind of things that are happening. What a great story of a brand that's kept its shine through generations and uh, reinvented itself so many times. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. lovely having Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome my next guest, Juhi Gorwara, Head Group Marketing and E-Commerce Philips for the Indian subcontinent. 
Juhi has over 17 years of work experience in areas such as strategic marketing, brand and reputation management, public relations, digital marketing, what have you. Prior to Philips, she was global marketing leader at Arisent, now uh, Altra. Yeah. Especially since you deal with so many categories and so many different types of customers, mm. does the does the brand need a purpose or a larger purpose to manage its way through weeks, months, years, decades, good times, bad times? How important is that purpose in defining what you're in business for and what you're delivering? Um, so with Philips, um, I'm sure most of you know that the brand has existed for a really long time. We're 120 years old globally. Um, in India, it's going to be 90 years by the end of the year. Uh, so the way a brand like this sustains for these long years is because of a purpose. So for us, it is about building a healthier and more sustainable world through our products. Uh, our goal is to touch and improve the lives of 3 billion people a year by the year 2030. So with that vision in mind, every product that we create, we are working within the health continuum of making an impact in the lives of people. Our tagline, Innovation in You, speaks for itself. We're innovating for the people we're selling to. Uh, it is products that are uh, directly helping them in some way or the other. So that's the basis of <clears throat> the innovation we create. So how do you sort of uh, move from here is the purpose, mm -hmm. here is why the company exists, here is what, you, what we are going to do, to this is what the consumer is seeing and this is how they'll recognize what we're doing, why we're different and why we're more trustworthy. Sure. So in this journey with us, the consumer moves with us. Their feedback is what helps us evolve and innovate further. Um, now, our business is primarily health technology. We divide it into um, large categories around the B2 business is uh, health services and uh, the B2C business is personal health. Yeah. So with personal health, it is the consumer products that most of us would be aware of, where we have brand ambassadors talking to people, selling our products for them. They stand for a certain value. Yeah. They stand for their credibility. So we're very careful when choosing these amb ambassadors who speak to uh, the consumer for us. Um, on the other side, where we're doing the health business, there, uh, while we're not selling directly to the consumer, we are selling to healthcare practitioners, we're selling to hospitals, we work with the government. But there, I think it matters even more because our brand is saving the lives of people. Uh, we need to know how it's helping them, touching their lives, the testimonials, the feedback that we get based on diagnosis and prevention of uh, diseases really helps us so evolve. Actions build the brand, Absolutely. is what you said. Absolutely. And uh, large brands often compete with small brands in the same space. Right. How do you manage to bring a value proposition like that out? How do you manage to keep the brand alive? How do you keep the, how do you keep the brand sort of standing above the rest of its mm. competition? Sure. So uh, it's you know we do have competitors, new competitors coming up each day in most of our categories because, like you mentioned in the beginning, there are so many categories. Yeah. So within each of those categories, we've got to ensure uh, the product one speaks to the right target audience and engages them in a meaningful way. Uh, with digital marketing, there are ways to reach people specifically how and where you want to. So we use the right tools for that. Um, with platforms like Amazon and Flipkart, reviews and ratings play a key role. So we do have our targets for that. Uh, we want to make sure those are all genuine comments that are coming from the consumer. Mm. And we take them pretty seriously by not just using them to sell our products, but also learning from them. Uh, and again, the innovation piece comes back there. So based on what consumers uh, would want, uh, we're listening to them and innovating accordingly. Okay. Are there any questions from the group? Philips is, of course, an iconic brand and it's been... What I particularly find uh, very unique about Philips is Philips has exited a lot of categories. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's exited with the brand name. So Philips Lighting, a lot of right. us, some of us might not know, is no more a part of Philips. But they use the word Philips and it's Philips Lighting. Right. And I guess there is a royalty agreement for a couple of years, uh, which means it's a very, very commercial brand. Mm. And this uh, maniac focus on staying relevant, continuously moving to a new category, mm. exiting categories which are not the core, 
So what's what's the sutra which holds us all together? Thanks, Apurva. About 128 years ago when we started, yes, Philip started with the lighting world. Uh, that's what the company stood for then. But over the years, as brands evolve, uh, companies end up taking the decisions that help them sustain themselves and grow. And with our larger purpose being impacting the lives of people in a positive way, uh, there were choices that needed to be made to make us more sustainable, uh, to keep that purpose going with the brand name. Uh, the products that we made had to fit within that and whatever made the maximum business sense. So that's a decision that was taken for the brand. There is legacy to the brand. How do you manage that legacy, especially in an age when brands need to evolve and evolve fast? Hmm. Uh, how do you manage that transition? Because uh, legacy possibly has this way of pulling you back into, into a generation ago. Right. Uh, so over the generations, people have associated with various products. There is a generation that would associate uh, with the radios that came out. There is a generation yeah. that would then associate with the lighting. Yes. And today there is uh, the millennials that would go with the uh, styling products in male grooming, female grooming. So with the consumer products, that transition has been very distinct because the products have been very varying in nature. Uh, so I think um, when I said earlier, listening to the consumer becomes extremely important and also responding to them. There are times when people would reach out to us asking for a product that we no longer make, but because we owned the product, they feel that we're responsible towards uh, yeah. taking a call on whether that product works, doesn't work, transition to a new one, whatever the question yeah. might be. We've got yeah. to handle that delicately, make sure they don't lose the trust in the brand and help them in a very genuine way. And Philips is certainly a brand that uh, has used uh, its legacy of trust to transcend many generations in many tough times and not just survive but grown. Yes. Thank you so much. It Thank was you. wonderful having you here. Likewise. Wonderful being here. My next guest is the Director of PR and Corporate Communication for Volvo Auto India, Sudeep Narayan. Sudeep is an old friend who's taken numerous initiatives pertaining big brand philosophy and you know the whole design for you platform and partnered with uh, big events like Airsail, Open Championship, an illustrious career in advertising and marketing. Welcome back to the show, Sudeep. From whatever I can see around me, legacy brands, mini legacy brands, uh, need, are having to do lots of soul searching, often crashing under the weight of their legacy, uh, often losing their premium and succumbing to the pressures of what's happening in the world. So how do you manage the premium in the premium brand especially with the kind of legacy that Volvo has. You talk about legacy. I think words like uh, disruption, mm -hmm. startups, these are not 10 years old. They have been existing. I mean, look at us. 50 years back, we disrupted the market by giving the seat belt free of cost. Wow. So right. that's an invention, right? And we gave it free of cost, free of royalty, free to mm -hmm. own. So there is a little bit of Volvo in every car. Yeah. The story remains safety for Volvo, mm. right? So we started making safer cars, or cars for safer people. Now we've started sustainability, which is safe for the environment. We go by this freedom to move in a safe, sustainable, and a personal way. Uh, and that's where we've re-engineered the brand. Uh, so there is a section, or rather there is a company called Volvo Cars Tech Fund, mm. right? Uh, imagine a car company investing in tech and the human machine interface is where we have taken a very giant leap. So what we do in, uh, in Nordic countries is we've, there is a cloud-based service. Okay. So let's say, and it, there it's icy. So roads can be very slippery. Yeah. So let's say a Volvo goes, you drive a Volvo, your Volvo is going and, mm. and, and, and the wheel slips. There's a message that goes to the cloud service. Let's say I'm coming a kilometer behind you. I will get that message at exactly at what point will your wheels slip. So even if the road is, let's say, 110 kilometers per hour, I will come down to 60. You know, if there is a traffic accident, it will immediately inform me, especially in snowy conditions, you know, when they're mm. bumper to bumper. So my, my question is, if you're building durable brands, then your philosophy needs to be the same, not changed, but 
the avatar of philosophy needs to be in tune with the times an article that i read said that almost every car that got released in the world over a decade and came to india and stripped down prices the first thing they removed was safety features and that's how they saved the cost right and here we're talking about safety as premium yes. uh, what does premium mean in your case has the definition of premium changed does it now border around luxury or is it so, just not discounting fantastic question i think yeah the market dynamics everybody is discounting but i think the biggest luxury in life is life itself so once somebody realizes that you know we haven't changed our car in fact our cars in india are much more higher spec than cars in europe and us because here the customer is very discerning uh, we sell about 60 to 70% of our top end versions the base models don't sell while our some of our competition it's their base model that sells yeah. so one needs to understand that you either in the business of discounting or you in the business of luxury we are selling 2000 cars but but the kind of loyalty that we are gaining and i'd like to talk about two loyalties you know everybody talks about customer loyalty i think non customer loyalty is equally important because your current non customers are going to be customers later on you know and we have a very strong loyalty in in both customers as well as non customers is there any question sure. yes you know yeah. these yeah. very high end premium very expensive cars with all these uh, lovely uh, technology a small nick and goes to the garage yeah, and 50000 right, rupees 1 I mean, lakh rupees absolutely right but it's 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 the trade off so if my worth to my organization to my family or whatever you know if i if i value that worth uh in in terms of road safety see people don't i think more than I, we need to educate people how many of us wear seat belts in the rear it's a must i mean how many times have you seen in print in the newspaper that the car is completely banged and people have lost their life but the seat is absolutely intact so if you're stuck to the seat it's common sense nothing's going to happen to you unless until it's a very very uh, you know rash speed of 120 130 whatever i mean then then no car can save you you know i think it's always very admirable when a brand stays true to its core and staunchly true to its core and is willing to grow slower but stronger and 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 ride through on the strength of you know a very very strong core so thank you so much so we that was fantastic what a great case study i'm very pleased to invite my next guest Smita Murarka head marketing Amante MAS brands uh, Smita has worked with brands like Lifestyle Louis Philippe and Alan Soli in her career having steered the launch and growth of many companies be it related to apparel accessories or footwear Smita has a deep understanding of consumer fashion needs Smita has been a part of the brand studio live before and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you back uh, Smita in a category that's 90% maybe 95% unorganized that is very price sensitive unfortunately very price sensitive and where you are actually trying to uh, build category information how do you manage to retain the core of or the authenticity of uh, who you are the values that you are trying to bring to this category and the core message that your whole brand has been built around which is a complete contrast to everything else in this category is i think today more than ever it's becoming more and more important to be authentic and true to your promise because conversations are getting carried forward uh, conversations are getting multiplied for a brand like ours which has been around the over 12 years in india and has um, over 3 decades of expertise in the same category authenticity is the core of everything that we do and it comes very easily so this brand was started by the parent ms holdings which is based out of sri lanka It has about over three decades of uh, designing and manufacturing for the world's best lingerie brands, and that itself means what we are able to offer to the Indian consumer is much more superior, because our technology, our innovations, we are fully backwardly integrated. So what we are able to offer at a similar price is far more superior, and that's something that got us started in this country 12 years back, and it has kept us alive. I agree. Um, so our conversation, our marketing. um efforts have been to really drive understanding earlier we were talking about confidence 
Today, our narrative is similar. Of course, we have to liaison with the consumers in a very different way because the millennial audience is conversing in a different language. So that changes. But we still are talking about what is confidence to the consumer, what is being really uh, you know, confident inside out and how, what a difference that makes. But because we are authentic to our promise, the loyalty comes naturally. And consistency is the key. Yes. Because uh, the one thing yes. that you've done for all of these years is be consistent, not change course. Yes. So when we launched uh, our first uh, runaway uh, differentiator was a product which was offered by other brands in a very um, lackluster way or it, it was almost like a compromise. And we said, you know, if you're going out, if you're a working woman or if you're a woman who wants to dress up well and needs a certain kind of product, you don't need to compromise on the way you feel. So we did offer styling along with functionality. And today also that's our differentiator, you know, fashion along with functionality, where you don't need to compromise one versus the other, where probably in, in a lot of other uh, brands and other options available, they do that. So that's something that we've stayed consistent in. Except that uh, at the points at which you're available, the type of customer that you're now encountering uh, has very different aspirations from 12 years ago or 5 years ago right. and possibly their fashion needs have also changed. How has the brand evolved with that? Um, you know, in this category, functionality is still a core. So even if the consumer's discerning and fashion, uh, you know, fashionable uh, consumer for outerwear, there's a lot of functionality that she still needs. Um, so we've in fact been at the forefront of uh, forerunner of that and we've offered fashion with functionality. That's something unique to us because that's our signature, that's our differentiator, that's something that other brands are not able to offer. Fashion only in this category is very frivolous. It's not something that you can buy into. So if, if uh, there are consumers who are buying into that, they probably know, know better. That's why knowledge and content becomes very important. So once they've adopted a brand like ours, it's very difficult to take them away unless we falter on our promises. So there's lots of loyalty? Yes. So authenticity is a driver, a lever for loyalty in this category. Um, in fact, that's something that's really sustained us. And in this whole functionality plus fashion, uh, the, the dual sort of value proposition, uh, what happens when there are bad times and when other categories are hit and there are price wars? Uh, is this a category that's that's disrupted? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, somebody was telling me, you know, um, the economic uh, situation is also driven by something called the underwear index. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, something, you know, even the largest of economies uh, follow. So in this industry, uh, definitely the consumption of uh, undergarments is a big, uh, uh, you know, reflection. However, um, even though our industry has experienced slowdown three years back when demonetization happened. What does the index show? So the index shows slowdown, of course, because the number of pieces have gone a little slower. Uh, but that has happened in the high premium and, you know, the more fashion oriented categories. Since it's a basic category, the basic products still continue. However, this category has also seen some crazy numbers in the last five years that I've been part of the category. So about 40 to 50 percent growth year on year over five years is something that we've enjoyed for a long time. Awesome. Any questions? Yes. Um holdings or company makes uh, you know lingerie for some of the leading brands i think victoria's secret and a yeah. lot of them and they're also all you know i mean all of your customers are also looking at india as a key market so how do you uh, you know keep the balance with your own uh, you know house grown brand versus the brands you supply to as your key customers uh, in sri lanka today most of the leading brands are stemmed from um partners or from uh, parent companies which have been suppliers right because that's where your expertise comes from if we cater to over 100 brands we know the category like nobody else yes. and um, that's a way to grow right uh, because uh, if you know a category so well the only next uh, organic uh, movement is to launch a brand of your own the teams are different that's why we have MS brands uh, which is the branded division and there's MS holdings which is the supplier division which operates completely different um, so this is something that most of the leading companies are doing and uh, that's the reason why we are able to innovate ahead of competition. On that note, and having learnt a lot, thank you so much. An admirable brand journey, yes. I'm very happy to invite my next guest, Ali Rizvi, National Sales Manager, Garmin India. 
being in this capacity for over eight years now, Ali has been instrumental in extending the overall leadership in Garmin. In the past, he's held leadership positions in organizations such as the Hindustan Times, Welcome Back, and the Indian Express and Bharti Airtel Limited. My question to you is, one thing that has changed our lives is technology. It's brought down cost, it's democratized the world, it's allowed the small player to compete with the big player. Uh, since you have direct experience in your category with how technology can actually either level the playing field or give you a competitive advantage, talk to us about that. So let me just first of all start with explaining something a brief about Garmin so that people could understand that what we do in India. So Garmin has five different product lines. We are into aviation, outdoor, marine, fitness and automotive. And that is what Garmin makes out. Sure. So uh, we have gone through a lot of transition, a phase where Garmin was uh, predominantly focused towards portable navigation device or we call it as a personal navigation device which gets fitted into any car. And then Google came in and it was like uh, a good change that happened. And the company really, really transformed itself from a predominantly focus towards portable navigation device to a company which is into lifestyle. So we got the technology which is of GPS into your wrist. That is what is. So navigation could happen from your wrist. Stress is in everybody's life. Yes. It's all about management. And our product tells you what is a stress score and not only tells you a problem, but also gives you breathing exercises so that you are able to control your uh, heart rate and your stress score basically. So this is just an example I give. There are various other features like SpO2, volume of oxygen level. When you're going up, especially towards the hills, uh, your oxygen level in blood would come down drastically and you would not even know. And these kind of a features or sensors that Garmin has developed over a period of time in order to make life more simpler, navigation more simpler, um, and that is what Garmin is all about. Uh, wearable technology is the new it. Yes. It's what's defining our new urban millennial lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is wearable technology therefore uh, your uh, crusade to the world? And is it what's going to define the brand? What's that journey looking like? Uh, very, very apt question. I think in Garmin's journey, this has played a very, very critical role. Um, transiting from... Or, uh, mainly from an automotive to a lifestyle and um, our um, products like wearable devices played a very, very significant role in order to make the brand um, uh, competitive and to states what we very strongly believe is superior quality as compared to the competitors. For example, I, I tell you there are a lot of smart watches available in the market, but we came up with a watch which does not require a smartwatch, which does not require a charging. It was awarded as a best innovative product at CS 2014, uh, VivoFit 1. And now we have a generation. Now we have a fourth generation product. So I think we have gone through a transition in a big way and technology plays a very important role. And in order to stay relevant, it is very important to innovate. I'm going to be provocative and say that, uh, you know, technology, uh, especially wearable technology comes in so many forms these days, including yes. from phone manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming into our lives from everywhere. Yeah. But I have a sense that uh, design yeah. is actually the piece on top of, of this technology yes. uh, that's driving a lot of consumer demand. Talk exactly. to us a little bit about design and what you're doing there. Yeah, so I think you made a very valid point. So what we have done is we have segregated our clientele. So we have uh, and we offer products to each and every category. For example, we have a product, you'll be surprised to know we have a product for kids. We call it as Vivo Kid Junior. So that's one. We tied up with, uh, and then in order to, we went a step ahead and we tied up with partners like Disney. So we made Disney characters for kids in order to make it for kids. Um, now we tied up with Star Wars characters and a lot of other stuff. That is one aspect. Then, um, uh, guys who are just growing in college. We made a product which is uh, called Instinct, which is for college goers. The best part about, you would be very surprised to know, it is India's first product with US military standards, wow. MIL 810G. In order to make it cut it short, very simple, you throw it from a third floor, it would not break off. Something where, and it is compatible to Android, iOS platform, 
uh, very good battery life. That is what is the change that we try to bring. We never ever believe in me too stuff. Whatever products that we come out with, whether it's aviation, outdoor, marine, fitness, automotive, we always try to bring something which is innovative. Something which is, like I told you, a product which does not require a charging. It's an innovation within the category itself. Anybody with a question? In different ways, but probably your category and brand is very similar to what we do in lingerie, where you not only have to educate the consumer on the technology and what it offers, but also the brand. Yeah. So how do you manage that? Because um, consumers would probably be willing to pay for a known brand, uh, which is out there in the open. What we have done is, for last three years, in order to build this category, we have built two uh, exclusive brand stores in India. One is in Delhi, one is in Bangalore. And we plan to have few more brand stores in TRA cities. That is one. Second, what we have done is uh, introduce chatbot so that we could, for example, I tell you about SpO2, volume of oxygen level, a lot of other stuff. People would love to know more. So chatbot is another aspect. We launched customer care number, toll free number so that customer could call up and ask more about our features, services. We have established in uh, last couple of years uh, two um, service repair centers because these are watches which requires service in aspect. So these are the stuff that has been done. Apart from this, we tied up with players, exclusive players like uh, Helios, Just In Time, Shopper Stop. These are the places where customers could go experience our products. That is what we have done over a period of time. And we would continue investing in order to have a better experience for the end customers. Superb. On that note, Ali, right. thank you so much. It was wonderful having you here. Pleasure. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on episode 4 of Brand Studio Live Season 2, co-hosted by the HD Brand Studio in DMA Asia. A heartfelt thanks to our friends from DMA Asia and Vatsal Asher for powering this event. Big thank you to our radio partner, Fever FM, who helps evangelize the concept. We'll be back with another episode soon. Stay tuned.